Hello, I'm Jesse McAnally. And I'm Andrew DeWolf. And welcome to Musical Sushi. It's a podcast where I try to get Andrew to like musical theater week by week and show by show. And today marks the end of our Phantom Month. May, but also kind of in June and also kind of in April. Uh, depends on how Andrew gets this episode out. We're trying to get this out in the last day of May. Look, we're going out of Phantom Month, not with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs> you know, you know, you can't, you can't hit the bang without a decrescendo, and this is the decrescendo post Dario Argento's film. Like, you can't end on that. I mean, we could have. We could have ended on that. We, we chose not to. We can't. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel after a month of not really covering any musicals, we had to cover a musical. And I wanted to cover the granddaddy of the Phantom musicals, as I would call it. The one that inspired Andrew Lloyd Webber to make his. Inspire, rip off, whatever, whatever words you want to use. Although Andrew Lloyd Webber has openly admitted he was inspired by this. So take that for what it was. This is Ken Hill's. Phantom of the Opera. is a musical with book and lyrics by Ken Hill with music by Giuseppe Verte, Charles Junot, Jacques Ovenbach, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Carl Maria von Weber, Gaetano Doziet Donizetti, and Arigio Bioito. Forgive me, all those dead people. <laughs> Based on Gaston LaRue's Phantom of the Opera. It premiered in 1976 on July 26th at the Duke's Playhouse in Lancaster, where it proved to be a hit. But, you know, things happened, and Ken Hill would later add the opera music to make it more of an opera and more of a comedy. Then Andrew Lloyd Webber saw it after his then-wife and or girlfriend, don't quite know where the timeline was at the time, Sarah Brightman was courted to play Christine in it. Andrew Lloyd Webber saw it and was like, Hey, Ken Hill, um... Would you like to collaborate on something like this um, and developing a bigger scale version of this on the West End? Um, and then they, they I mean, Ken Hill and Andrew Wood Weber had worked together on Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. So they had a history. They really wanted to have Hill involved, but in the end, Lloyd Webber chose to pursue the musical without Hill and develop the Phantom of the Me Opera. He does have a little credit like, hey, we, we kind of were inspired by you, but... Basically, what Andrew Lloyd Webber did overshadowed this original musical by a lot. Oh, that's an understatement, I would say. Um, no, I don't <laughs> think anyone except for like the Uber fans really know about this one. Um, but the plot of this one is the Phantom of the Opera is about the hideously disfigured Phantom's amorous obsession with a magnificent, naive singer. Which, yeah, fair. <laughs> I thought I would have more to say about this one. I'm not going to lie. I was like, oh, yeah, this will be the granddaddy. <laughs> like, this will be a good one to end on. It'll be what Andrew Lloyd Webber inspired. It'll be a nice little twist of fate at the end of this. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't nothing. It's, um, man, we've had some fun conversations about Phantom stuff because there's been some wild ones that we've covered. And this is this is the most boring version of phantom that I think maybe even exists. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent on that, but it's, it's down there. It's, it's, it's a snooze fest. <laughs> it's, it's rough. It was a rough sit. And <laughs> the very specific production we watched, it was not, hmm, what would I say? When you see people tell jokes on stage and not even the audience is willing to give a courtesy chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's unpleasant yeah. the the jokes in particular really feel like um why are they even here and maybe that's just because i we have been watching phantom and they're all kind of this dark horror aesthetic even even like weber's version has that kind of it's it's more of a vibes thing than an actual horror but like it feels that way you know um and then this is just like they're gonna tell jokes we've got the we've got the yucks for you and it's like 
<laughs> it doesn't work and none of it's funny and I don't know. It's obviously a play in the melodrama of these operas that it's trying to pay homage and pastiche to, but <laughs> Christ almighty, um, does it fall flat? Maybe if you have really, really good performance. No, I can't even say that. Nope. It's just, it's just a nothing of a musical. I, I've always wondered what the Phantom of the Opera would be like if there was like a ratio of 70% managers to 30% Phantom. <laughs> Who it's doesn't so want fucking, that? It's so true. And I, I feel like part of it is because they're, they're being a bit, I, maybe I'm wrong. I feel like they're being faithful to the, uh, to the book. In kind a way. of, but also not. They do it in the most boring way. Like you just you want to see some of the like phantoms escapades a little bit, and all we're getting is just like the managers having a laugh and oh ho, ho you think there's really a ghost? How that's silly! And and there's the the one lady who's like convinced that there is one, or I don't know. It's it's and it's like it just doesn't fucking end. It doesn't. It just keeps going. And then the only music they ever have is just lyric lyrics put to uh, an existing opera piece, which I, I don't fucking know. <laughs> and the lyrics aren't bad. I feel like Ken Hill's real strength here is in the lyrics. Yeah, that's fine. It, it, it's not bad. And just it, it would feel better if it felt more like an actual story narrative opera. Honestly, I feel like if it was more like if it was just singing, maybe if they were just singing, if it was sung through yeah. or something like that. Because I feel like as um, soon as a song starts, you're kind of back into it because these songs are unobjective are objectively great. Like they're the classic like opera pieces. Yeah, but like maybe make it more of a true opera, like just have it be sung through. I know that's a lot more work. Obviously, that oh, is yeah. a lot more work. But maybe you should put work into your show. I, <laughs> I, I, I can't even say that this is terrible. Like, it's just, there's nothing That's to the thing. it. Yeah, like, like, objectively speaking, like, the Dario Argento version is <laughs> worse. Yes. Like, just worse. Like, Phantom of the Mall is, is just worse. I, I, no, um, and I kind of have a soft spot for Phantom of the uh, Mall. But, like, like those, those are, like, objectively, like, cheesy kind of just bad pieces of art whereas this is just it's just fucking boring and not that funny and you know what in like a bad way it kind of reminds me of um what's that fucking uh west end show we watched that was also like really boring let's and they, see is they, it fame is it uh, i forgot about that one <laughs> like literally is it we will rock you no no that one's bad that one's bad I was thinking about the one where they they never get to the fireworks factory. They never they never get the the banjo or whatever. You mean Andrew Lloyd Webber's By Jeeves? <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me of By Jeeves. A little bit. I do. I I com- actually that is the most apt comparison I've ever heard. <laughs> oh my god, you have, you have nailed it right on the head, my friend. At this point, we appear to have run out of narrative. <laughs> Jeeves. Sir. Ah, I think the story's in need of a, what do you call those things? Deus Ex Machina, sir. Sounds like the chap. It's a little better than By Jeeves, but not, it has the same, like, tone. It's... It has the same sort of problems, like, it's, it's right there. By Jeeves <laughs> had more jokes that landed, and it felt like the narrative suited it better. But it didn't have the good opera songs. No. So they both have their own strengths. Although it says something that that by Jeeves strengths are strengths of the the show and and what was written, whereas the strengths that Phantom of the Opera has here is the opera songs that they just stole from other people. It stole loosely. They, yeah. They're repurposing them. <laughs> I mean, I don't even think the opera songs are badly fit. Sincerely, I think they fit well. No, it's the it, thing that doesn't fit is the g- comedy hijinks of Raoul talking to the. The, the conductor and asking him to please stop playing the music and oh I have to go through the chorus girl's room to get into Christine's room um it's just it's the jokes don't land and the guy who plays Phantom God bless his soul he's trying but there's nothing the Phantom is not a character in this no he's basically just a antagonist yes. antagonistic force that exists and then by the end, he's sort of a character, but even then, like, not really. 
Uh, my favorite part is when they take his mask off and they reveal a different mask underneath it. <laughs> and it's very clear that it's just a different mask. The makeup is It's just a mask. There. It's like a little... It's not even makeup. He literally takes it off. It's not makeup. Like, it, when he, uh, when the show ends, he, he actually has it, like, off his, it's like, it's just, it's just a mask. Yeah, he just has a little, <laughs> little black nose at the top of the mask, and that's it. He looks like Batman. Yeah, he does have the, um, the weird, like, uh, Sweeney Todd hair. I like the weird Sweeney like... Todd hair, though. <laughs> I like that Christine's a blonde in this production that we saw. Christine is a blonde in the book, and she's so rarely a blonde in any adaptation, so I, I appreciate that. God, are we already out of things to say? We're yes. like 10 minutes in. Yes, what We're is like there to say? We're 10 minutes in. What is the plot of this? <laughs> who is our lead character? It's Phantom of the Opera. It's just Phantom of the who Opera. Is our char- who is our lead? Oh, I mean, our lead is kind of the managers in this it one, is, isn't it? It is, right? Yeah. <laughs> that is the fascinating thing about uh, At least that's an idea. That's an idea. It's the worst possible choice. <laughs> it is literally the worst possible choice you could make. Is like, let's have our lead be... The fucking side goofy characters that do nothing. <laughs> like, like, what do the managers do during during Phantom of the Opera? Like traditionally, they just kind of they 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 complain. put the obstacles against the Phantom. Like, you know, like, hey, we're we're going against your wishes. You know, they're being like an a slightly pushing against the Phantom. That's about it, though. That's and, about and it. Really, even that, like, the Phantom does most of the stuff that he's gonna do, um, just because he wants to do it. You know. And like, <laughs> um, I don't know. There are things in this that are not in many other adaptations, including the Persian character. But somehow they still fuck that up by making him the Phantom's brother. Yeah, that's the weirdest shit. They, it's like they needed the Phantom to have like something. So they're like, he killed his mom and dad because he was deformed and no one who can see the deformity can live. Mm -hmm. or something which is just just i don't fucking know and then of course he tried to kill his brother but he failed and his brother is now trying to like get revenge but the best part is the beetlejuice style forced marriage at the end (laughs) oh yeah yeah that's not from the book right no that that just happens there is the boiler room which is in the book the escape room basically that he puts them in yeah, there's not much. Raul against the book. He is like the son of the manager that takes over. Yeah, so that's yeah, but that's like barely even a thing. Like that doesn't even matter really. It's so weird. Like the fan does the phantom even get redeemed? He just kind of stabs himself and is like, "Oops, goodbye." <laughs> he sort of redeems himself by doing that. That's like <laughs> his. They his... went full Jekyll and Hyde with the ending then. Yeah, his saving grace is that he doesn't he doesn't kill Pristine and himself. He only kills himself. And that's that makes him a good person. It's like, okay. That that feels like the bare minimum, man. And then like, she <laughs> looks up to the the mezzanine and says, He was always my angel of music. <laughs> some jokes that i like in theory that i think in execution are terrible like when the managers are like look at that chandelier man if that fell it would it would hit all the people there at least those in the cheap seats would be fine and then when the chandelier crashes it's the one that's on the stage for the opera that that's at least a joke yeah well uh, they do it a couple times the joke is like oh in phantom the chandelier falls and look where the audience is sitting look above you guys when it falls, you're going to be crushed. Uh, and that's the joke. And they, they play it up a couple times. But it's like, it's so tongue in cheek. Like, it kind of works. Maybe if I was in the audience, yeah. like, per- physically there, and I could look up and see the chandelier, that would be funny. Um, but it, that was, that. yeah, 
I also can't imagine that that would play very well in a in a in a setting where there is no chandelier above them. I yeah, <laughs> I feel like very little of this works for me. The Phantom <laughs> is neither scary or funny. They try to make him scary, but that that mask is not doing any favors. No. He just he it literally just looks like he's wearing a Halloween mask, but it only goes around his eyes. <laughs> it's it's like <laughs> um sincerely, this is I wouldn't say this is one of the worst things we've covered. It's just there's so nothing to it. Um, I, we've covered stuff like this before. It's it's these are always so fucking hard to talk about because it's like, what do we say this beyond just a lot of there was a lot of boring choices. Nothing was that bad. Nothing was that good. So we're just kind of imagine you and around. I you, imagine <laughs> you and I are Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh going into this um, to watch it. Do you leave inspired? <laughs> like I could do this better. I mean, maybe inspired in that sense, like maybe maybe Weber was genuinely like, dang, I think my wife was so good in that Christine role, but this play fucking sucks. <laughs> maybe we we got a thing going on here. <laughs> you know, there, there is at least one good thing to come out of this, though. I mean, we, we did get a a very successful musical that has some good tunes in it. Yep, yep, yep. Andrew Lloyd Webber and Ken Hill got the credit. Like, I think this would have gone into obscurity had it not been for Andrew Lloyd Webber oh. kind of giving it a platform by saying, this was my inspiration. Good for him. Yeah, literally this, no one would have ever talked about this, ever. There is no <laughs> fucking way. This would not be being performed. This, like, this, this, this probably doesn't even get performed, it does, does it? It does. Like, it still does. Like, even the production we saw was like a 2014 production. Oh my god. Why would you like okay, I get that if you're playing Phantom, maybe you can't get the rights to to the Weber one and you yeah. want to still do it. Why not do the uh the American one? You you Is you, it hard to get the rights to that one? Yeah, it, it it's not hard. People do it. I I I don't know. Like why why this? Maybe it's just cuz no one else does it. Maybe you have trained opera singers that want to sing proper opera but also tell a new narrative. That could be an interesting one. Okay. I find it hard to believe there's not a Phantom of the Opera opera, though. Like, that must be a thing, it right? It must be. Um, I can't think of one, but there has to. Right? There has to be one. If it is not, like, geez, somebody get on that. <laughs> That's a huge missed opportunity. <laughs> yeah, as far as most of the internet is concerned, there's three, four Phantom musicals. This one, the Andrew Lloyd Webber, the American one, and Love Never Dies. And then I guess you could maybe count, like, Phantom of the Paradise if you want to be a stickler if you want to be like well it's a musical and it's based on it a little bit (laughs) how did you feel the songs were integrated into the narrative i actually think the songs were fine honestly genuinely i i I, like they don't come out of nowhere no and they're sung well and i i mean opera makes sense it makes sense to do opera songs in phantom of the opera i mean the whole thing takes place in a fucking opera house like it makes sense so i think it works fine And, and, and i like that they wrote like little lyrics to uh to these and didn't just like do uh just the normal opera lyrics like it's it's new i i i think like i honestly think ken hill's strength as a lyricist is the biggest thing here <laughs> like it really is impressive and i think he's very good at funny lyrics he's just not very good at funny book writing <laughs> <laughs> well i mean we're we're gonna have a section to talk about the songs and i feel like that's one of the only things we have to talk about yeah so... but what well, let's look at this review wanna, though do we want to look at these some of the reviews for this because i think that would be at least a little interesting okay it's time for previews it's time for previews so this review is from i believe the los angeles times from december 1st 1989 written by dan sullivan the title was ken hill's version of phantom no holy terror um, so we're okay. used to New York Times. Let's check out the other coast. So let's say, see what they think of theater. There are more ways than one to screw up the Phantom of the Opera. One way is to turn Phantom into Jack the Ripper. That's the approach to the latest film version, whose appeal would seem limited to surgery fans. Referring to the Robert England film. Yeah, I'm, yeah, critics love horror. We know this. Yes, yes, they are very <laughs> kind of horror films. Um, elevated horror is a stupid phrase. Um, 
Another way to spoof the story, that's the approach of Ken Hill's Phantom at the... Oh, another way is to spoof the story. That's the approach of Ken Hill's Phantom at the Wiltern Theater, not to be confused with Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom at the Amazon, which is said to have been inspired by Hill's version. Not that anyone would confuse the two shows. Phantom at the Amundsen is a trashy score, but it also has the grand scale of opera. Phantom at the Wiltern. Who wrote this fucking shit? That's them referring to uh, Lloyd Webber's. I know, but like, we're going to call Lloyd Webber's a trashy score? Okay. I get what he means. It's like, you know, pop. I guess, but that is, oh man, that is such a snobby way to refer to a pop score. It, it really is. <laughs> Um, Phantom at the Wiltern, the glorious monument to zigzag, Art Deco, is dinky. You have heard of bus and truck <laughs> shows. This one looks like it folds into a Volkswagen va- van with the cast sitting up front. Like fucking Scooby-Doo. <laughs> this need Actually, been... wait, this kind of is like Scooby-Doo. It really isn't it? is. <laughs> oh, Raggy, there's a roast. <laughs> This needn't have been fatal. Audiences have a way of adjusting to reduce position, production circumstances. We wouldn't have held the show's poverty row look against it if the events transpiring within its shaky frame had been funnier or creepier. In fact, a couple of stage pictures work better than the a- Amundsen version. It's clear, for instance, that we're on the roof of the Paris Opera when the story heads there. And I rather like the Phantom using an old rowboat when he spears Christine across the dry ice lake, a touch of verisimilitude in an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative. Hill's idea is to tell the story like a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta, putting his words to prim tunes by Donzietti, Meyerbeer, Gonard, etc. This is fine when he's joshing the denizens of the opera world, the demon soprano, the Swiss tenor, the monster ballet mistress, and the money-grubbing manager, exemplified respectively by the actors. Um, but the method is counterproductive when Hill is trying to invoke terror and make believe terror. It's perfectly possible to start out joshing a horror tale, and little by little seducing the audience to believe it. Broadway's Dracula managed the trick. Did it, though? Um, Lloyd Webber's <laughs> Phantom manages, at least for some viewers. Hill's Phantom can't. The libretto is too talky and the music too decorous. Always we're outside the story, having a mild chuckle at it. Yeah. I actually completely agree with that. I think that this critic is a little bit snobby in places, but I mean, this is accurate. It's just like, the way that they talk. It's always that. Yeah, but this is completely accurate. Like, um, you never get into the, the terror of, like, we see a murder take place, right? Mm-hmm. The, the devil guy gets uh, killed and, and his body falls onto the stage or whatever. Um, and what do they do with that? They take the, the chance to say, oh, there's a note written on his body. And then somebody reads his, his underpants and it says 100% silk or something like that. And, and they're like, whoop, that's the wrong note. It's like, this is... The, he just killed somebody. <laughs> this is a dead body. Like, why are we telling, like, a, a dumb little joke about underwear? Like, wh- Imagine how much like, better if they just, like, he's there, the phantom of the opera. Yeah, like, you have to have some sort of threat, right? Like, there has to be something in a story like this, because this is, at its core, it's a story about a killer. Hill also makes a mistake by incorporating some of the most tedious parts of the original story, complications that Lloyd Webber version rightfully realized only gummed up the action. The chase to the Phantom's lair in the second act is as interminable here as it is in the Lon Chaney silent film, more so in the production's lack of scenic resources. One can only accomplish so much with smoke bombs. Moreover, it's cool to make Baxter sing roulades through them. The evening's good points include the fact that Baxter and most of the company can in fact sing. Which I, I think is the same for our production that we saw. It's like, they can all sing. Yes. Um, in general, though, this is an overextended skit that has a great deal of trouble convincing an audience and itself that it is a big ticket musical. Top price is $35. Man, weren't those the days? <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the old Mayfair Musical Hall, at half its playing length, it would have been heaven. Why can't shows be the size that they were meant to be? For the record, the evening is sponsored by a Los Angeles Times Fund. There, I think I finally found something I wholeheartedly agree with there. Shows should be the length that they are, and tickets prices should be under $35. Can you fucking imagine if ticket prices God. for, like, Broadway shows were under $35? Um, $1.1989 is equivalent to purchasing about two forty five dollars today, so that'd be 39 times 2.45. That's about $95. <laughs> That's still not bad for a top price. 
Yeah, that's that's top price. They didn't yes. say this is the average price. That was the highest price ticket. Yes, I could live with that. Do you agree with that review? I think other than him just being a little bit snobby about the Weber version and the in the um, a Robert England version, I agree with everything else. <laughs> yeah, um, and that's like with the difference of like nearly thirty years between them. It it, it is interesting reading this review though. With yeah. One just one thing, I guess. It's interesting that the Weber one and this one were both playing at the same time, and that's that's weird to think about. There was just two Phantom of the Operas, and you had to you had to know which one to go see. <laughs> Imagine being your grandmother. <laughs> I got us tickets to Phantom down in Long downtown L.A. Oh my goodness, that must have been it cost you a pretty penny. Yes, the highest ticket price was thirty five dollars. Oh my goodness. Oh okay, this will be our birthday and our Christmas. All right, all right. And then you get there, and it's like, whoa, is it silk? <laughs> I don't understand all the fuss. Everyone out in New York is coming in their pants over this. I know it's it's crazy. This was really fucking boring. <laughs> I, I you want to leave during intermission? I think that's a good idea. I don't even care if I get my money back. I'm trying to remember what they did for like right before intermission. Isn't it just like does anything even happen? He just like carries somebody off stage, doesn't no, he? No, the Phantom does a, a something. Like there's something or other. I feel like the Phantom. He like hears them in the cemetery and sings a little ditty. Not the set on the roof, maybe. I don't know. It's I don't know. It was we've so been watching unimpactful. so many phantom movies. Like it's right so now. unimpactful that I'm just I remember just remember how like, we knew almost every bit of the Dario Argento version because that one stuck with us for better or for worse. This is so bland that it's it just blends into everything else. It's like. It, I'm going to forget that this is even a real version of Phantom. I'm going to like remember a scene from it and I'll be like, "Oh, that was from like the the Weber one, right?" And and you'll you'll have to remind me that this existed. <laughs> yeah, or you'll be like, "Was that Love Never Dies or the American one?" Might the one been. where he reads his underwear. Which which one does that happen in? Was that and, in and, by and, Jeeves? <laughs> and you're going to be like, "No, no, there's this this guy Ken Hill who wrote uh his own Phantom." <laughs> <laughs> it, man, I, 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 this is one of those things that you have to convince people exist, you know, like, <laughs> like it's a fun fact you pull out of parties. Like, hey, did you know that there's another worse version of Phantom of the Opera? Did you ever want the Weber version, but worse in every way? <laughs> that love never dies. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's true, but, <laughs> but like literally though, this is this is basically the same story as. Most of the other ones just with no interesting choices. The the new choices that they do make are just completely boring and forgettable. They're the easy like, answers. Like who cares? Who cares if if the 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 Persian is is his brother? I, like who cares? Does anyone care? <laughs> oh my god, we got Dotson. See, no one cares. <laughs> Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we got a show to you. Today's show is brought to you by the extremely kind donations by our donors over at Patreon. Tell us a little bit about Patreon, Andrew. And Patreon's where you can go if you want to give us a little bit of money and also get some extra content. We have commentary tracks, we have extra podcast episodes, we usually do meetups. Um, by the time this is coming out, we should just should be wrapping up with his stuff, so we, we should have a... Yeah, end of June, I'd say we should have another meetup. Yeah, we should have some stuff coming up pretty soon. Um, um, also, we do have a high tier patron, uh, uh, Monica Thoreau, who gets to have one paragraph that we are allowed to read every week. Um, they kept their short. It wasn't like, uh, <laughs> and they will eventually join us on the show to talk about a show they want to talk about. And Monica Thoreau's message is just a reminder to all people to get their yearly eye exam and to not sleep in their contacts. Um. Yeah, I, I I am excited because they're an optometrist. I have a lot of eyeball questions for them when they come on. We're gonna have to do a show about eyeballs. Is there an eyeball show? Um. Ooh, is there? Hold on. I'm eyeball imagining the musical. That, that that 80s movie with the big eyeball. I forget what that's called. <laughs> there was an episode of Pee Wee's Playhouse with a giant eyeball creature, and I'm oh god. Eyeball creature. You know, while you're looking that Pee-wee's... up, why don't I read our current? No, patrons? no, you need to see this. This is important. Oh yeah, oh, this horrific thing. Um, his name was Roger. 
Roger the Giant Eyeball? Yes, I am sending it to you now. Um, if you are not on Patreon, you will not get to see Roger the Giant Eyeball creature recurring character from Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yo, that's Mike Wazowski. It's a horrifying thing. I hate the fact that it exists. It gave me nightmares as a child. Yo, whoever made Mike Wazowski was definitely inspired by Roger the Giant Eyeball. <laughs> He has one foot, one eye, mouth out the side of his eyeball. Beautiful. He's, he really is. Our current patrons are <clears throat> Melissa Goldman, Danielle Renix, Justice Stampede, Ewan Cassidy, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Lathaniel Sacy Coombe, Joseph Evans Green, Mary Lou Choquette, John Vanals, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Gracie, Kyle Summers, Janae C., Scoot in the Technicolor Dreamcoat, Liz Lim, Nothing is Certain Except Beth and Texas, Thesbian, Rebel RMS. Jessica T, Mitchell Young, Chai Keek Tika, Katie McDonough, Chris Marcote, Kiji Marie Anastasio, Leela, RJ Nariga, Bjorn Hermans, Toriana Frazier, Sammy the Most Lopez, Liana Morton, Kaylee Blazier, Cinemageddon Reviews, Villainous Miss, Sofina Ali, The Omega Geek, Paige Pearson, Maddie Wargle, Eliza Erdman, Anna Loskatova, Cheska Vare, Sarah Den Blaker, Evan Ball, Zachary Torres, Rora Morasso, Mara Forloin, Captain Rod Taskic, <laughs> Lisa L, Nobody, Renee Thompson, What Did Boris Say, did Puffy Boris Boy, say? Summer, Julia Hardy, and Jay uh, Kusia. And these folks give us a little financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals the Cheese. They support the show by giving us dough. If you'd like to join them and get your name read by, incorrectly by Andrew every week, come join us over here. <laughs> Um, God, I just want to stall because I don't want to talk about this show anymore. <laughs> we could talk about the music at least. I guess. I guess if we're going to like scrape the bottom of the barrel like that. Um, let's get back to it. So we start, of course, as every fan of the opera musical starts with the managers. <laughs> Sir, I'm so delighted. Everyone is so excited. What we need is someone new, just like you, to pull this sinking ship back into shape. And then we might forget the very dreadful way that really awful things go on here every day. That's quite enough of that. You're not supposed to rat. Slip out, no doubt. Ignore him, dear sir. Of course, you have to start with the main characters. Yeah, yes. The managers start... are and always have been the most important fan of characters. Truly, 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 truly. I hate every moment that I spend with them. And I love the manager stuff from the Weber musical. It's probably like my favorite part of the Weber musical, well, Lloyd Weber musical. But in the Weber musical, they're like a side thing. Yeah, and they're a breath of fresh air. And Prima Donna is probably like one of my favorite pieces of intricate musicality that Andrew Lloyd Webber's done outside of like Jesus Christ Superstar. Here, though, they're kind of forced into this main role where they don't really work. No, and they have no drive. They are just joke machines. <laughs> and yeah. none of the jokes are funny. So it makes it's like having Deadpool, but he's not funny. So the music is all opera. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like some of it I recognized, some yes. of it I didn't. Um, so some of it was like more famous, some of it was not quite as much. Although if you're an op if you're like an opera fan, like a more avid opera fan, you probably would recognize everything. Yeah, like um, these are not <laughs> like deep cut opera poles. It's like Bazette. No, and <laughs> no, these are not deep cuts. I didn't recognize some of them, but I'm not like a avid opera listener. So, no, these are know. like the this is like baby's first opera choices. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and some of them, like, I think everyone would recognize. Like, but this is one of the rare versions of the Family Opera where he plays Bach's Toccata, uh, Toccata and Fugue. Ba -da -da, yep. ba -da -da -da. Which was, uh, they played that in the, at least in some of the 1925 version oh, uh, yeah. of the movie. They play that. Yeah, um, but that so. wasn't a choice by the movie. That was just the choice by the editor of the movie. Uh, True, like, but 100 it's years in later. The movie. It's in the movie, though. Depends on the version. I don't count that. <laughs> People think it's from Dracula. No, I don't, I, know why. I don't know what it's from. I think it was just a piece of music. I mean, don't people associate that with Dracula, though? I guess. I guess. Do is you... it in the Dracula movie? I don't think it is. 
I've never seen. I don't watch these like old ass movies. You don't watch movies. <laughs> I think Andrew, if we're gonna learn two things about you from doing the show, it's that you don't watch movies and that you don't remember any actors' names. I feel like the first one is less accurate than the second one, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> You've never watched a movie. You just watch musicals and Breaking Bad. Is there any particular song you want to talk about? Any any funny lyrics? No! I'm looking at this and I'm like, literally have nothing. Nothing! There must have been some funny lyrics you noticed. You always do that. I Literally, it washed over me, this entire experience. <laughs> I, I remember the last song that the Phantom sings in Act 1. I'm like, oh, okay, you're, you're doing that again? To pay my heart selfishly do my senses have devoured my soul. This cruel love tortures, consumes me. Love I love I will never control. I guess one good thing you can say is, even though they, I think, I, I believe they wrote all their own lyrics for this yes, stuff. Ken I'm Hill wrote sure. all of them. Um, none of it, like, was memorable in a bad way. No. So that's good. I mean, there's nothing that was like... I, I was, respect like, it less because it's not bad. Like, say what you will about Love Never Dies. I respect it for going so bad shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're doing freaks? Like, at, at Coney Island? Okay. And I think I think you you almost mocked me for saying this, but like I I, I do have a, a more respect for like Dario Argento's <laughs> Phantom of the Opera because of of the horrible choices it made. Because at least at least it had the balls to make those horrible choices. <laughs> yeah, to say we're not doing this. Um, I kind of like the 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 Phantom history story, the In the Shadows, Dim and Dreary. Until the day that he possesses her. Now he possesses her, the phantom of the opera possesses her. I get that's kind of like the angel of music moment with uh. Uh, Madame Giri from the Lloyd Webber one. That, that one's pretty neat. That The Persian is the one who explains his backstory yeah. in this one, though. Yes, yes, yes. You know how I knew I was not going to love this? When the first line, the first line out of any character's mouth. Do you remember what it was? No, I don't, but what, what, what was it? It was literally a ballet dancer on stage who said, Shit! Oh, fuck, you're right. And they open like, it with a fucking ballet dancer for no fucking reason. I remember that now. And it's not Christine. Christine doesn't show up till 45 minutes in. No, Christine has like no role in this because she's, of course, she's not the main character. The managers are the main characters of Family <laughs> Opera. Is Everyone knows this. The most prop I've ever seen her in. And she's been a prop in many a stories of Phantom of the Opera. You know what we didn't talk about when we talked about the Robert England one is, is that Christine in that one is kind of badass. Explain, because I agree with you, but I'm curious as your justification. I mean, she actively, she actively pushes the fandom away, tries to kill him, and then in the future version, successfully does uh, kill him. Like, yeah, you're right. So this is that was the most agency Christine has ever had in a Phantom of the Opera narrative. Like, because usually Christine, like, like the fucking one we just talked about, Dario Argento, like, More she's my like, love. Oh, don't she's go. like desperately in love with this rat man <laughs> like and and even like the the weber one like she she can't turn away from him and then like love never dies only makes that worse i mean and it's like, in the original she had agency she's like oh i might be into you and then he goes murder man she's like i'm definitely not into you goodbye true but it's not it's not enough and then love never dies ruins it yeah <laughs> i don't know like christine gets gets kind of like she should she should be the one that kills him I yeah, I mean, is there any other version where Christine kills the Phantom? I mean, there's only one where she dies, and that's Love Never Dies. Like, yeah, so the Robert Inkman one, she kills the Phantom. She doesn't do it in, like, any of the, like, musical versions that I'm aware of. I mean, in the book, if you, 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 this is a big stretch, let me be clear here. 
She gives him a kiss. He feels redeemed and then dies because it broke his heart. Did she cause that death? No. And even if she did, that's not her trying to kill him. Like, she didn't know that was going to happen. There's no way. And the Herbert <laughs> Lom one, I'm pretty sure um, we did not talk about that, but she's on stage no. performing. Someone's cutting a chandelier. The Phantom removes his mask and j- pushes her out of the way. And then the chandelier crashes on him, killing him. Does that count? No, that's the Phantom. That's the Phantom doing like a noble sacrifice. If anything, that's like the opposite. That's honestly one of the more likable Phantoms, and it is the only one aside from Dario Argento where he fucking slaps her. In this one, uh, the Phantom threatens, like, so the the Ken Hill one. Uh, the Phantom threatens to kill Christine and himself. Yes. After doing like a forcible wedding, which is just like weird. Beetlejuice style and forced wedding. Yeah. And then we're we're supposed to be like the Phantom redeems himself because he chooses to stab himself, not not kill Christine. He he's like, I will not kill Christine if I don't I don't even remember. You he make will some spend bargain? your life with me, and then I'll kill us both today. <laughs> Uh, and, and I I forget, but doesn't Christine like even say something about how like he was a good man? At, at, all no, along, she's like he was, was always my angel of music. He will not go without a friend. But, and he was once my angel of music. gonna kill you like 10 minutes ago yeah he had the <laughs> knife he revealed it pretty intensely he had it to her throat <laughs> what a movie what a show props to the robert england one r- legitimately one I, of like, the better the more... adaptations <laughs> christine gets gets her revenge i mean legitimately like she saves the day none of them like i'm looking at the list none of them does christine do anything <laughs> Maybe the 1991, but maybe the, the the American musical adaptation. But it was more his dad. I I don't think I don't think that I don't think that counts. Yeah, I wish I wish I had a better answer. I really wish I did. Um, my God, what what a fucking mess! What a fucking mess! <laughs> do you want to do like a Phantom Month recap? I guess Phantom Month recap is the only thing we have left to do. Actually, no, we should compare this to the book. Yeah, We've done that for everything yeah. else. The book, this does have a lot of book elements, like the Persian makes an appearance, but he is, it's like they include pieces, but then they still do it differently in a different way. I feel like this one feels the most accurate. Yes, like they, the Phantom is nowhere near as much of a presence or a character the way that he is in the book. It's also, it is more of a mystery, like yeah. because we're following the managers and not Christine, and not the Phantom, we kind of actually have, there is some chance that maybe you could think that there was a Phantom. Like an actual ghost. Well, this is what you've been asking people to make. This is what you said you wanted people to make, and they made it. What's your thoughts? Personally, I wouldn't have made it this way. (laughs) (laughs) You wouldn't have made it a broad, stupid comedy? I still think that the, the plot elements and the way that, like, having him be a sort of mystery character could work and be fine. But this doesn't, this is completely wrong and just not how you should do it. <laughs> I completely agree. I, I, uh, it's just a uh, nothing. I, Raul is closer to a main character than either the Christine or the Phantom, which is also very much like the book. He also has the weird, like, she's cheating on me part that doesn't last very long. Yeah. <laughs> he gets angry, sings a song about it. The audience laughs, I guess. I it's oh, so they bizarre. They laugh it's with the so enthusiasm bizarre. of someone held at gunpoint. It's honestly it's it's very funny because I bet you an audience member that's watching this at in in the time around where it, like when it came out and like the Weber one had just come out. This uh, this almost plays like it's supposed to be a spoof of the Weber version. Yeah, but it's it's but, literally not. It's like the opposite. 
<laughs> so much worse. Everything is so much worse. Um, and I'm not a fan of the opera Defender. Like, I, you know I don't love the Andrew Lloyd Webber musical that much. I don't really love it either, but there's, there is just, there's a lot more good elements. Like, you have to admit that there's way more good elements in that than there is in something like this. Oh, definitely. But I, <laughs> I still think the American musical is the best interpretation of the story, because it just throws it all out and does their own thing. Yeah. So, why don't we do a, a Phantom Month recap? Yeah, uh, let's go. And just kind of, what did we cover? Like, wh- where did we end so, up? What did we learn? previously... We've covered The Phantom of the Opera, Lloyd Webber, and Love Never Dies. We did them back to back early on because I knew I didn't want to like hold them out. I was like, yeah, if we're doing them, we're doing them. Uh, and I still stand by that call. We made the right choice. Um, then we did Phantom, the American musical, much later. Um, one of the better things we've covered. Then this month, we started with The Phantom of the Paradise. Then we moved on to The Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge. Then last week we did um, Robert Englund's Phantom of the Opera and Lon Chaney's Phantom of the Opera. Then Dario Argento's and we're ending with Ken Hill's because I thought, hey, that'd be a good ending. And no, it was not. It ended with a fizzle. So, I mean, Phantom Month, I think, was overall a big success. I but think it feels so, like too. We're ending, it, we're ending it in the worst possible way where we picked the most boring Phantom adaptation of all time to cover <laughs> at the very end. <laughs> yeah i mean it does give us time to reflect on what's happened before us um and appreciate where we've come as opposed to where we've been which one do you think was the most wacky i mean obviously it's between phantom of the mall and Fan- dario argento as far as pure wackiness like there is a couple contenders i would say i think phantom of the paradise has a lot of wackiness in there um, a lot of a lot of goofy a lot of goofy fun elements. Phantom of the Mall, of course, is I mean just off the walls bonkers. I didn't think that we would top that, but we we actually far surpassed it at this point. <laughs> yes, uh, we had two very good guests for both um, Phantom of the Mall and Lon Chaney's with uh, Christy Esserly and Amanda Hunt. Both of them are were lovely, lovely guests and had a lot to bring. Yeah, so the Dario Argento Phantom definitely is the most off the wall bonkers. Like, yeah. It's there's just too much going on, and it almost it almost feels like we we still haven't done it justice even after talking no. about it for. Over I want an a hour. director's cup of, cut of that uh, movie. I want the three hour version. I want to see if it makes more or less sense. It probably less, honestly. <laughs> I don't think they're going to clear anything up. They're probably just going <laughs> to add more weird elements that don't make sense. The Phantom's brother was actually a rhinoceros. <laughs> of of the ones we covered this month did you uh were you the most surprised by most 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 enjoyed upon revisit sincerely it was dario argento's that was a lot of fun to revisit with those weird historians um but i think i actively enjoyed the robert england one a lot um that was a good actually entertaining watch and i didn't hate phantom of the mall as much as i thought i would phantom of the mall honestly not even that bad <laughs> You were very it negative really in the wasn't. episode, but I was very negative. But now that we've covered more, I'm like, that one of the better adaptations. That... Yeah, it's like, wait a second, like, what are we comparing this to? You know. <laughs> now, not to top chin to our other show on this network, but how would you adapt Phantom of the Opera? Let's just say Blumhouse or A24 comes to you is like five million dollars. Make a Phantom of the Opera adaptation. Don't care how you do it, as long as it is an adaptation and you know how loose you can be with that nowadays i would want to ditch the the time period and i'd want to ditch the um the setting like entirely no france no america or no france no modern or 20th century yeah i just i i feel like it's been overdone and just i i i'm i feel like we've done it so much at this point that we have to do something different so I would want to go probably like the Phantom of the Mall route where we just kind of pick a new location and just go. I think um, I think you should still keep it in an opera, in my opinion. You think it should be like a modern day yeah, opera Yeah, you know, like one of the ones that are kind of run down that people don't go to. Like, I feel like there's a lot of potential for that and playing the aspect of operas really aren't the scene anymore. I like and- the Phantom of the uh, Paradise concept. Um, yeah. where it's instead of an opera house, we have like a rock venue or something. I like that one too. Um, um, have you seen uh, Have you seen Green Room? Yes. What about like something yeah, like that? That would be but very like, unpleasant. 
Yeah, like, um, but it, you know, instead of a green room, the spoilers, neo Nazis. Instead of that, it's a phantom. <laughs> I would say the best way to get around it is give him the magic. Let him be a ghost. Fuck it. Like that's the only way to really get around like the thing that oh everyone knows the phantom is the phantom and it's just a guy. It's true. And we you could even maybe flip it entirely and have it be there's people claiming that it's a man and and like they think that it's like a stalker or something yeah. but then it is a ghost <laughs> and like in the literal form um the other way i i've had this pitch where it's a literal ghost in the christine allegory whoever it would be because i i kind of like where we're going with this give her agency make it like <laughs> a monkey's paw kind of thing where the ghost is like yeah i'll train you yeah i'll do what it, i'll do whatever you want um but you 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 got to tell me what you want. And so it starts as like these normal things like, oh, yeah, I would like to have lessons. And then it would be great if they wouldn't be on tonight. And then it goes on to depraved things. But everything has to be Christine's choice to make happen. I think I um I gave you this pitch when we first started Phantom Month <laughs> a while back. And it was um it was the idea that the Phantom maybe isn't even a phantom at all and isn't even pretending to be a phantom it's just the composer at the opera house yeah and he's highly respected and is wants to train christine but he's like insanely obsessive and like stalkerish and Dude, that feels like, real world terrifying <laughs> yeah and and i think the comparison i gave was the more modern version of the invisible man right um like that those kind of themes um but instead I mean, maybe we could bring it back and we put it back into the uh, old opera house. Yeah. But now, instead of a guy that lives in the sewer and is disgusting and everyone <laughs> hates him, it's just, it's the composer that everyone respects. And she's trying to, like, tell people, like, this guy is, like, fucked up and he's, like, doing this to me. And they're just like, that guy? Like, no, that guy is, uh, like, nobility. Like, no. <laughs> yeah, the wealth disparity, and maybe reintroduce the Phantom of the Paradise, you know, um, um, Dorian Gray thing, where he you can keep him ugly, but without showing him being ugly, because that is a little ableist nowadays. There's a there's a lot of potential to do different stuff with this. And I feel like people but... are just too afraid to get out of the Android Weber musical shadow and just kind of want to hit all the same beats. I think that the themes that I like from all versions is the kind of um paternalistic like weird vibe between uh the phantom and christine where but i don't like it when she li i don't like it when she likes it. yeah that's weird i think that that's what i don't like i don't like it when she's into it i think the like, robert england version rides that line perfectly in a way that others really fall over one side or the other like, it would make sense if she's into it at first, but mm -hmm. it needs to be something where she realizes what's actually going on and then is like, oh, fuck no. <laughs> I agree. No, I think I think we might have something. I'd really like like uh, Invisible Man style adaptation of Family Opera um, where. Oh, God, wouldn't that be a twist? Um, what it, where he's the phantom and like he dresses up as the phantom or something. But yeah. like he, there's not even there's no guy that lives in the sewer like. People are like, no, there's no phantom. There's a guy that lives in the sewer, but there isn't a guy that lives down there. There's a, there's just the composer guy that dresses yes. up as a guy that lives down there. Or just rigs things <laughs> to try to have more control and be the one that decides things. That's, that's kind of interesting. That's at least a pitch. And, and like the whole movie is like, she has to try to prove that he is doing all this. And I mean, probably the conclusion would be that she can't prove that he's doing all this and she just has to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, big murder man. Uh, <laughs> but Phantom of the Opera. Phantom well, of the Opera. It. Um, we've what talked is, it to fucking death. We are. We'll see you next year for Phantom May next month. I don't know, maybe if I remember. <laughs> if <laughs> Phantom Month will come back whenever Jesse's doing something that's emotionally taxing outside of this. <laughs> It, it we'll cover the other opera from Dario Argento or some shit. I Honestly, I think you'd actually enjoy that one. I kind of like that movie. Uh, it, what, what, there's so much phantom shit, but I feel there like we've is. covered so much. We, we've covered a good amount, but we haven't we haven't even scraped it. We haven't talked about Song at Midnight, The Phantom of Hollywood, um, The Phantom of the Megaplex. <laughs> Phantom of the Megaplex? Is that even different than Phantom of the Mall at that point? 
<laughs> yeah, it's at a Megaplex, and it was a Disney Channel original movie. Oh my god, what the fuck? Um, Phantom of Camp Rock. We didn't talk about Return of the Phantom, the point-and-click graphic adventure game developed and published by Micropose. Okay, I mean, I'll talk about a, a classic adventure game. That sounds fun. Honestly, I wouldn't mind doing a Let's Play series with you and I on that. <laughs> we we there's still... we were going to play the, uh, the Les Mis fighting game. I was going to beat your ass in that shit. Honestly, I feel like maybe we should do that for like a charity night or something. Uh, what was that? It was called something silly. I forget what it was. Uh, Les Mis, Jean Valjean Revenge. No, it's uh, it's something really weird because it was like a, a Japanese game. And oh, it's a Japanese? I thought it was Les French. Mis, Les Mis in that language sounds like something else and they called it that. I can't remember. <laughs> Either way, if you want us to do that for a live stream, uh, maybe we'll do it on Patreon. And we'll place bets. Uh, we'll make a betting pool and whoever wins will donate that money for, to charity. <laughs> How's that sound? It's called Arm Joe. Arm Joe. That's that's weird because the Japanese uh, anime of Les Mis is called Les Miserables Jojo Cassette. No, so Les, Les Miserables in Japan is known as uh, A, A Mujo, A um. Cruelty. <laughs> <laughs> A Cruelty. Ah, the French from But of wine. course it sounds, it sounds like Arm Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you know what else sounds like arm joe our cheese ratings what was your overall thoughts on the phantom of the opera by ken hill and your cheese rating holy fucking shit this one's boring don't yeah. watch this one don't do it it's not worth your it's love. not worth your it's not worth your fucking time you uh, love yourself don't do this to yourself i'm just gonna put it on the tier list really quick uh, oh, this yeah. is in uh, this is in c tier okay. below phantom of the mall i feel like really? it's too okay uh it's it's like right barely above D tier. I think you should move Phantom of the Mall above uh, Weber's, the Andrew Lloyd I, Weber I also movie. think I'm going to do that as well, yeah. Like, okay, and then uh, cheese rating. Like, honestly, I would give this like a themed cheese or something, but it doesn't fucking deserve it. This is like, uh, it's like milk. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like the most boring, bland, basic dairy product you can imagine. Uh, it's that. I give this cottage cheese. It's not even cheese. What, what is this? What are you trying to sell to me? Like, it doesn't go down easy. It doesn't mix well with anything. You're trying to convince me it's a fun superfood. Fuck you. I'm sorry, Ken Hill. I know you inspired a, a, a big fucking super thing, but this ain't it, chief. No. <laughs> you got creatively cucked by Andrew Lloyd Webber. You're one of many. <laughs> He he beat you. I'm sorry. He this is better. I I don't know what else to say. <laughs> uh, maybe one day you'll write a good musical. I actually I think Ken Hill is dead, so I don't think he can. Hey, he wrote a. He helped write uh, Joseph. I guess. Uh, yeah, he died in January of 1995. Well, your work will still live on, and we'll piss all over it. Sorry, Ken Hill. Yeah, maybe he's got some good stuff in there. Maybe I don't know what else he, he did a play version of the Invisible Man. Invisible Man, really? Yeah, we were just talking about that. The Mummy's Tomb and Zorro the Musical. Okay. Know what else is okay? Our wonderful patrons. Thank you guys for listening. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and Musical so Cheese. Leave us a review, goddammit. It's been a minute. We'll read it on the show. Promise. Even if it's bad. We don't even have to do a good job. We still got our two mil. Um, please follow us on Twitter at Cheesy Musicals, Patreon Musical Cheese, Instagram Musical Cheese, YouTube page Musical Cheese, Patreon only podcast, Patreon with Cheese, email us at musical theater lives at gmail.com. Our keeper of the cheese is Juliet Antonio. Here is some ASMR for you, Juliet. Ken Hill got cucked. Thank you to the Broadway Podcast Network for having us on the platform. Anything else you got left to say, Andrew? This Ken Hill guy, I feel bad. His his Wikipedia doesn't even have a picture. No one knows what he looks like. He has no nose. Poor Ken Hill. You and, deserve better. And thus ends Phantom Month. Poor Ken Hill. We'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese! Ba-ba-da-ba! Ba-ba-ba!